let's get started. Um, I am going to talk about Chapter 7 in your Intro to American Deaf Culture book. Our work is focused on ASL and how it is the language of the deaf community. Let's start by talking about what ASL is and what it is not. Um, so, ASL is recognized um, and accepted as a language by the majority of linguists and the academic community as a whole. Um, there may be specific groups or individuals within that group that don't agree with that general consensus. Uh, ASL has the ability to express any thought, idea, or concept, just like we can express our ideas, thoughts, concepts in spoken English. ASL has an independent grammar that's different from English. Um, the example that we like to use is instead of saying, I'm going to the store, you would sign store, me go to. Different grammatical structure is very different from English. And then, of course, it has a compositional structure at all levels. So that includes, um, just like English or any other language, it has a phonology, morphology, syntax, and discourse elements that we'll talk about later. ASL is not a crude form of communication. Um, it's not just gestures and mime. Um, this is a misperception that many people have um, before they learn ASL, and then they realize that signs have meaning, and it's not just signs and acting things out. Um, and ASL is also not a substandard language um, with regards to its ability to express itself and articulate thoughts, ideas, concepts, feelings, um, so some people like to compare ASL to um, the, the pictographic languages of the Egyptians, hieroglyphics, um, cave drawings before language was developed. Um, American Sign Language, of course, is none of those things. So now I want to talk for a minute about focal vocabulary. Um, it's mentioned just briefly in your book, but there's a section um, that talks about it, and so I feel that's important for us to discuss. Um, so many cultures have a focal vocabulary. In other words, it's a set of terms and definitions that they've developed that relate specifically to their culture, whether it be a minority culture, an identity culture, that kind of thing. Um, some examples are um, gays, African Americans, Jews, um, Hispanics. Um, a lot of those minority groups have developed a set of terms that don't exist outside of their culture. Um, several examples that I want to show you that are also shown in your book. Um, the first one is a hearing person. So that, of course, is this. A deaf person that has that thinks hearing is this. So they take the hearing sign and put it up by their, by their brain to show that they're thinking in a hearing way. And then, of course, signer. This is one that was, excuse me, was also developed. So those are the three. Hearing, hearing, deaf person, and signer. Um, so, of course, when these vocal vocabulary terms um, talk about the living conditions of the community, um, talk about their way of life, their culture, um, and describe all of those things. Another um, topic that your book also talks about is how it's interesting that music is not valued highly in the deaf community. Um, the people that value music are hearing people that maybe um, use signs. So an example of that is the fact that there's only one sign for music, and it's the same for music, song, sing, concert. So this is a sign right here, and you would use that sign for each of all of those words or concepts are going to use the same sign, which kind of shows you that obviously it's not something that's highly valued in the deaf community because they only have one sign to express all of it. It's not something that they really use. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the prescriptive rules of ASL. Um, so a prescriptive rule is when it takes the rules of the language, examine it, examines it, analyzes it, puts, takes it apart, um, similar to what a teacher, an instructor, a linguist, a language book, um, might do in order to teach grammar of a language. Um, all languages have prescriptive rules. It's how you teach and learn the language. Um, so we are going to divide prescriptive rules into four parts. Uh, phonology, morphology, uh, syntax, and discourse. So we know that in English, phonology is divided into 
cells or folds. Those are the smallest contrasted units. For example, when we're in preschool, we learn that the A ah sound and the A sound, or the I sound and the I sound are different. We also learn that there's vowels and consonants, but versus the um, all of those are phonemes, and that ties into phonology. Um, in ASL, we obviously don't have phonemes because we don't have sound. So we're divided into five, well, four or five, depending on who you talk to, the parameters. So when we, when we dissect ASL into its smallest contrastive unit, that is the parameters. So we take one sign and we piece it apart and we figure out what the location is, what the palm orientation is, what the handshape is, um, and what the movement is. That is the smallest contrastive unit. <clears throat> um, so some examples that your book gives, um, and I need to find it so I make sure that I explain it correctly. Um, but they were talking about how what's acceptable in one culture doesn't necessarily mean it's acceptable in another. Um, and they took the examples of even within different country sign language systems. So I think they uh, they were comparing. Sorry, I'm trying to find where is that here? Okay, they were comparing um, Mexican sign and American sign. So ASL versus um, uh, Hispanic sign language, and trying to show some examples. So um, one example that they used is um, the middle finger. Um, in, in ASL, we don't use that because it's considered offensive. However, um, in Japanese sign language, they use that because it's not offensive. It has a different meaning. Um, another example is the T hand shape, which we all know is the letter T. Um, <laughs> It is used in ASL, but it's not used in Japanese, French, Filipino, Costa Rican, and other sign languages. Um, and that's considered obscene or offensive. So it's kind of interesting that comparison of how even just the smallest contrastive unit can carry different meanings across different cultures or different sign languages. Um, and then, of course, um, there's this study by Valley and Lucas in 2000 um, where they made the case in point that non-manual markers should be considered as the fifth parameter. Um, depending on who you talk to, some people agree with this, some people don't. Um, the case they made is that the fifth parameter does show the smallest contrast unit and with or without non-manual markers can make a sign correct or incorrect, can make it a different sign depending on what that is. Um, so that's also important. So then the second prescriptive rule that we talk about is morphology. Um, so morphology is the study of morphemes. And a morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit of a word or sign, whether spoken, written, or signed. OK, so the morphemes um, that we talk about, we compare English versus ASL. Um, so some examples of morphemes in English would be um, dis, um, which can mean that, or it can mean something different. Sometimes it has a meaning attached to it as a prefix. Sometimes it does not, and is a whole word. Another example would be S at the end of a word. If you add that, it makes something plural. Um, another one would be L-Y to the end of the word. can make a difference between a noun and an adverb. And then E-D at the end of a word as well can show um, tense. So those are some examples in English in ASL. Um, some of the examples that... Holcomb talks about our noun and verb pairs, which we learned in ASL 1. Um, we learned um, sit versus chair. So we learned that the verb has one movement, whereas um, the noun has two. Um, so that's an example of morphemes and the study of morphology. Another example would be how you can incorporate two concepts into one sign. So they use the example of if you do two on your chin, it means two years old. If you do two on your wrist, it means time. Um, and then, of course, um, they also talk about the rule of nine. For example, if you have two weeks in the future, two weeks in the past, 
um, that all indicates that there is a change in meaning for the smallest meaningful unit, meaning the morphine. So that's also important. Um, and then they also talk about how you can show meaning um, through location. So that could be age, time, gender. We talked about that already in the past, so that shouldn't be anything new. The third prescriptive rule is syntax. Um, so this is very important, something we've talked about a lot. Um, but syntax is the analysis of sentences um, to be able to determine gra grammatical structure. It examines word order and sentence types. We're all familiar with the syntax of the English language. Um, however, in ASL, we know that um, non-manual markers play a huge part in the syntax. Um, so one example of that would be our eyebrows. If we raise our eyebrows at the end of a question, it's a yes or no answer. If we furrow our eyebrows at the end, it's a WH question. Um, who, what, where, when, why, how. Another example that we've talked about um, some is topic comment structure within American Sign Language. And instead of it being traditional subject, verb, object structure, which is typical English structure that we use, they actually use object, subject, verb. So we've been working on that. The example that I shared with you is in English we would say, I'm going to the store. In ASL we would go. So the structure is different. Um, and then of course we have to add those grammatical markers. So examples would be raise your eyebrows with store. That is the comment and then you go and nod your head with your comment or with the rest of your sentence. So that's very important that we remember that grammatical structure must have non manual markers. That is what makes a sentence grammatically accurate, grammatically present. Our third, or our, I'm sorry, our fourth and final prescriptive rule is that of discourse. Um, and this is something that's new to all of you um, because we have not talked about it. Um, but discourse involves a great deal of things from conversation, turn taking, interruption strategies, um, climax of story, um, different conversation strategies. Um, there's this huge bubble that includes all of that. Um, what I want to talk to you about is number one, topicalization is very, very important. So some examples of this would be in a conversation. You always state the topic at the beginning to avoid misunderstanding or confusion. That way they know right away what you're talking about. You also need to, as the listener or receiver, to indicate that you understand this is the topic being talked about before a conversation can continue. <clears throat> you also need to restate or reintroduce the topic at the end of the conversation. This is known as the diamond structure. Topic listener acknowledges, tell your story, restate topic, end of conversation. Um, the other structure that we have not talked about is the funnel structure, which is topic, tell the story, without any restating of topic at the end. Another thing that's important to remember is that there are turn-taking or interruption strategies that can include eye gaze, um, use of hands, facial expressions, those are all important parts of turn-taking and interruption strategies in American Sign Language. Um, in um, English, we tend to use a lot with our tone of voice. Um, so, for example, if we want to interrupt someone, um, obviously there's an oral component to that. But also turn-taking, a lot of that has to do with um, voice inflections and how we use our voice when we have conversations. Finally, academic ASL. Um, this is something that has just recently uh, started to produce research. Again, diamond structure, topic, acknowledge topic, talk about topic, restate topic, conclusion. Um, academic ASL also includes proper formation of signs. I am going to pause here and I will start the next video.